we usually have very intimate green bag lunches uh, in our offices, but this was too good an opportunity not to make much bigger and invite some of our friends from around Seoul and the international community. I'd like to uh, have the afternoon take off with a few words from Director General Ivo de Boer, and then followed up by a presentation by Dr. Justin Lin. Ivo? All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Green Bank seminar, which has no green banks, uh, but it does have a speaker. And it is my honor to introduce you, Dr. Justin Lind, who will be giving a presentation this afternoon. Um, I have here a, a full briefing on your background. And the, the first thing this briefing note says that you are known for your bold action and your quiet manner. And if you are known for your quiet manner, then you probably hate it when people talk extensively about your CV. So I'm going to now talk extensively about your CV, because I think it is important um, that people are fully aware of your background, which is, which is very, um, very interesting. You contribute to, to academic excellence and international development leadership uh, and Chinese policy development uh, during your career. You have an MBA from the National Chengji University, which you received in 1978, a long time ago, uh, in Taiwan. A master's degree in political economy at Peking University in 1982, and a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago in 1986. And I've been told that you also achieved the swimming above. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, in terms of your work, you're the founder and first director of the China Center for Economic Research, a uh, former professor of economics at Peking University and the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, a member of the 11th National People's Congress of the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. You've been intimately involved in the development research center of the State of Council between 1990 and 1993. And, of course, you have been chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank between 2008 and 2012, which is one of the reasons why we were so honored to have the opportunity uh, to invite you here. You have been recognized throughout your career in, in many ways. Um, through an honorary directorate from the forefront of Fordham in 2009, corresponding fellow for the British Academy in 2010, and served as a consultant to major international organizations, and you are on the editorial board of several international academic and economic journals. So all in all, I won't read out the full page, uh, all in all, you've had a very distinguished career nationally and internationally. Um, your being in Korea was a fantastic opportunity for us to invite you here as a guest, and we're very honored that you have accepted that invitation and that we've been able to invite a number of guests to this green bag lunch without green bags, without lunch. To hear from you, and I very much look forward to this, about the challenges and opportunities that China faces at this moment in time. So, Dr. Lin, welcome and over to you. My PowerPoints.
Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and also the opportunity to see so many friends here to discuss one of the most important, challenging issues in our time. That is the global warming, the climate changes, and certainly China will be a very important element in the equation for the issues, or in the equation for the solutions. And that is what I'm trying to say to Ingros, the structural transformation, the challenge, the opportunity for China. We know that China is the fastest growing country in the world since the late 1970s. China maintained 9.8% growth rate continuously for 75 years. And it was a record that we never observed in human history. In such a high rate, sustained for so long, in such a large country. But unfortunately, on the one hand, this growth contributed to the improvement of the well-being of the Chinese people, reducing the poverty, contribute to the economic economic growth, not only in China, but actually in many other parts of the world. But the model of China's growth is not really sustainable because it's characterized by the traditional approach, that is high carbon, high pollution, and low carbon. And it's a challenge because in 2008, China surpassed the U.S. to be the largest and richest of CO2. And apparently, China contributed to about one quarter of the total emission of CO2 in the world. And the CO2 contributed to the global warming, and we all know that. And also, you know, certainly, if China did not do anything that we have business as usual, the total emission in China is estimated to reach about 35, 35 million. 35 billion. 35 billion tons in the time of 2040. If China takes, if China takes a low carbon in a scenario, then China may take a 23rd and then gradually climb to the level of 25 billion tons of emission. But if China takes an extraordinary gross cost, then China will be able to you know, have a declining much earlier than so certainly, I would say from the global warming and climate change perspective, the extraordinary low carbon scenario will be developed. And the window is that the Chinese government is very keen about this extraordinary low carbon task. And the reason is that because the pollution in China has become a political issue. Because all of a sudden, in 2030, in the first half of 100 days of the year, Beijing was covered by smog. And uh, in the first six months, about one fifth of the territory in China was hit by severe smog. And that's how some people now, you know, get. Beijing and Newland called the capital smog. And as you can see, you know, the picture in the song that was reported in the newspapers, it was widespread on the internet and so on. People were very unhappy about that. And uh, it's not only unhappy because actually it has a lot of damage. According to a report quoted by the New York Times in April 2nd, 2013, about the study in 2010. In that year, the estimation was about 1.2 million premature deaths in China. 
The number is about 40% of the total premature deaths in the world. And uh, that was equivalent to about 25 million years of strategic life, having power on the people. And now, pollution in 2010 was the number of four killers of deaths in China, next to the, you know, the, 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 the unsafe food, high blood pressure, and smoking of cigarettes. And according to the study, you know, it projected by the time of 2050, air pollution would be the number one killer in China. And damage in 2030 would be much larger because it was some kind of acceleration in the cost in this pollution and so on. And, and according to the study of the World Bank with the Development Research Centers of the State Council, they estimated in 2009, the total loss due to the environmental climate issues in China was about 9% of Chinese GDP. So it's heavy cost. And uh, likewise, in 2030, the cost could be even higher. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so the Chinese government is concerned about this kind of social unhappiness and a cost to China, and also because China has not escaped. Because China is a continental size of country. So certainly we know the environmental issue, climate issue has a lot of externality to other countries. But most of the impact in China are internalized because of continental size of China. And so China need to do something about it. And, and, uh, and for example, if we have a global warming, the rising of sea level, China will be one of the four large affected countries because of long cost the lines. And uh, also the agriculture, because I say a lot of the impact will be internalized. For example, if you have global warming, then you have a huge distribution of N4, and certainly that will be damaging to the crop yields. And according to the research, for the corn and the soy yields, the damage will be ranging from 2.225% up to 8 to 22%, according to different scenarios. So a lot of costs will be internalized. And also, you know, there are some recent observations. Even the low carbon scenario is not agreeable for them. And low carbon scenarios is based on the carbon hybrid community. You know, to reduce the CO2, admit the intensity of CO2 emission to 40 to 45 percent of the emission in 2005 and 2020. And also, the fair allocation principle that means that everyone is entitled to the admission according to the historical admission in other countries as well, to do a fair allocation. But as I say, even if we follow this, it's not agreeable in a sense, because the remaining room, the remaining room for CO2 admission to allow a fair allocation is uncompetitive. If we want to maintain the global warming within the target. Okay. And so we need to do some kind of extraordinary actions. And I say China has high incentive to do that. Was because of the internal political issue as well as China is a continental size. Any kind of adverse impact will be hitting China first. And when we try to do this kind of intervention, that's one of the ways I like to mention. That's what we call green paradox. If you only focus on one location, try to reduce the emission in that specific location by allocating, reallocating the production of the dirty or high emission in that to other parts of the country or the world. It won't help. And one example was Beijing, you know, building the 
Olympic again in 2008. Chinese government relocated a lot of heavy lifting from Beijing to Hebei provinces. And, uh, and uh, at that time, we thought this may help Beijing. But in effect, the emission in Hebei provinces also affect the air pollution in Beijing. And this is what we call green powers. And similarly, you know, some kind of country may try to relocate the uh, high emission industry to low income country. Currently, certainly, they are clean. But, you know, those kind of effort will increase the total amount of CO2 in the you know, whole atmosphere. And so, as a result, the global warming will still be there, pollution will still be there, smog will still be there. And so, that means that even the low common scenario, but they all pass the are all passes sustainable, and no common half is not sustainable either. And so, some kind of structural reform to follow the extraordinary low common scenario will be done. But for that, we need to do some you know, reform. And this reform certainly wanted to get price right the polluters need to pay the cost and uh, the, the green, you know, the green growth need to be, you know, providing incentive. And secondly, we also need to get the institution right. And uh, so, you know, this kind of policy can be enforced, can be sustained. And also we need to have the right of speech. And I'll explain that later on. But if China can take the measures to improve all those three dimensions, it can turn into some kind of opportunity for China. Because China needs to go green in order to follow the extraordinary, the, the, the low carbon scenario. It's more than the commitment in the open market. But the problem is that China needs to go green. And the low green can be a source of growth. And if China take action earlier for other than other countries, China can be a leader in those kind of technology industries and uh, benefit from those kind of green innovation. So that is an opportunity for China. And, and for China currently, even without new technology. There's many intervention which is not regret. That means that if we do some you know, incentive, some policy changes, we can you know, reduce the emission and at some time improve the energy efficiency and so on, those kind of things, and also improve the health. Those kind of things are extremely difficult, say, not regret measures. And if China is you know, really committed to the extraordinary green growth, China can be the leaders of that areas and uh, use the new growth to drive the growth in China to become a technology in the world. And so far, China is already the largest exporter of innovative technology product, like in green wheel, green meal, and so on. And that goes to the community in China and the opportunity that China already tried to grasp. Let me explain me a little bit not regret uh, uh, measure. You know, there are many areas. For example, if we installing your EDs in a room, the University of Convention of you know, the bubbles, a trade of bubble. And then we can reduce the energy use and it can also improve the health. And, uh, and a more efficient household appliance can also reduce energy, reduce you know, the emission and also improve the health. So there are many areas of that. You know, and if you're interested, I can show you my, my slides. Actually, this is based on the study of the World Bank and DRC about the opportunity in China regarding this and non regret measures. And there are many areas of that. And also, China needs to have some kind of structural reform. As I said, the current past in China was not sustainable, and it has some kind of legacy in the past. As we know, before 1979, China, like other socialist countries, were to some extent other developing countries, tried to 
trying to catch up the Hancock country. In that time, so they developed the capital intensive heavy industries. And that kind of technology related to the capital intensive heavy industry, like steel and so on, were very high energy intensive, intensive and also high emission. And that was the strongest adopted in China. In addition to that, because China was a socialist country, so China did not have much trade with the rest of the world, so China was used for looking. And uh, in addition to those kind of heavy industries to meet the domestic demand for steel, for cement, for you know, fertilizers, China also developed domestically many, many small scales, very inefficient. Uh, 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 firms in chemical fertilizers, in steel production, and so on. And their efficiency was even less than the large scale capital intensity. Lots of the legacy in, 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 the, in the past. And that was the reason why you know, China was so polluted in the past. And so the government needs to get some measures to change the structure of the energy and the structure of the energy needs. For that, we need to have a stick and a carrot. And, uh, and a stick was to put a tax on the dirty industries and provide some kind of subsidy to the clean industries. And that China also actively used, for example, if you buy refrigerators, and uh, you know, if you buy certain type of refrigerators, you will get subsidy from the government. And that is application of this, you know, stick and courage. And uh, we also need to have some institutional reforms. So certainly, for example, now the power grid in China is dominated, is you know, monopolized by the state power grid companies. And, uh, and now we want to promote the, the, the solar power in rural sectors. Agricultural households, they can in, install the solar panel on the roof of their house. And so they can generate the electricity. And, 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 and they may have some surplus. And if they have some surplus in electricity, if they are allowed to link to the grid, national grid, then they can get some return for that. They will have some incentive to do that. But you know that in general, the monopoly companies, they don't like to get involved with that because they're going to increase their cost. So we also need to get an institution right. And we also need to, you know, China is on a stage of urbanization because the rate of urbanization in China is much lower than other countries at the comparable stage of development. And so we can anticipate in the coming decades, China will increase the rate of urbanization of 1% a year. And during this process, we should go green in a sense, in terms of housing, in terms of the standards for the new building and so on. And also to use the green energy to provide jobs. That's the opportunities. And also, we need to make the rural sector greener. And the rural sectors, you know, they can have forestation and so on. And if we have incentive right, then they will have more incentive to grow tree and that will contribute to you know, less need for more, uh, uh, more absorption of CO2 and also less need for cut down tree in the forest and so on. So that will be an opportunity also. And also should allow rural households to use the solar power, solar panels, and, uh, and uh, link them to this kind of national grid system. If they can do that, I think that we can make the growth both in the urban areas and rural areas greener. China already makes some progress for that. The national leaders I mentioned, they are keen about the green growth, especially the understanding that a lot of the adverse impact will be internalized in China, so China needs to do something. You know, for China's outlet, also for the world. So China, the national leaders, they call for the estimating of the CO2 emission costs. And they try to introduce some very aggressive targets in the coming years of China's development. And China also tried to pilot certain new institutions like cut and trade in carbon, and currently already implemented 
in seven provinces. You know, so maybe you have a trade of the public pollution. We're permitted to that. And also, Chinese government and now also commissioned some studies on the environmental taxes and the carbon taxes. And so, you know, like China was starting to experiment that kind of new tax system. And then, you know, then, then use those kind of systems nationwide. And uh, as I mentioned, if we can improve the energy system, then farmers in rural areas will have high incentive to install the solar panel. And the Chinese government already made that a policy, starting to allow rural households to live. They are green, they are basically green. And if this policy is further extended to some industrial sectors, for example, steel sectors, they have energy. And they can use those kind of kit to generate electricity. And if you allow them to connect to the national grid, then they will have incentive to use those kind of waste and turn that into the energies. And also, China carried out a very important reform. That is the Kenyan reform related to the first land. Allow farmers to own the forest land for 70 years. And with this kind of secure, can work for the various lands so that the farmer will have high incentive for the reinforestation. And, uh, and that will have a few favorable impact. One is the increase the income of the rural household, narrowing the, the income gap between the urban area and rural area, reduce the poverty. And also, with the more forestry in China, we will reduce the pressure on the tropic forest land. And so we are reducing deforestation and the first degradation in the tropical areas. So that will contribute to those kind of surroundings as well. And, and, and so this kind of uh, improve letting Kenya security for the first can be as a model, not only in China, but also other countries. And the last point I'd like to mention is the trade issue. As I mentioned, for the internal purpose, it would be desirable for China to go green. Even the green technology may not be available now, but China, as a developing country, should be a technological leader in those kind of green technology because it will help China to achieve the actual ordinary law carbon scenario of the growth. And but. Technological invention in the new areas is very risky, very time intensive. China, if you look into the state of Rome, that is not a damn near chance compared to one interest. To be the provider of new technology for the world and for China. But because of the global warming concept, China cannot follow the old path. So it would be desirable for the Chinese government to subsidize the domestic innovation in green technologies for China. And with that kind of technology, certainly China can provide those kind of product and technology to the rest of the world. But currently, there are some kind of dispute. Because, as I said, without subsidies in the green sectors, China will not be leaders. And if China is not a leader, it's not good for China. But once China become a leader, then China will provide those kind of product to other countries. Then other countries start to accuse China for dumping, for subsidizing its export. So that's a dilemma there. But I think that if we really take the global warming a serious concern, then it will be resolved. No matter which country subsidize the innovation in the green technology will be acceptable, will be in the world. And as I said, China is a continental sized country. For China's own consideration and for the rest of the world consideration, it would be desirable for China and for the world, for China to be the leaders. And, and, and I'm delighted to see that there's some trade dispute with the EU last year but it was addressed as yet. So that would be a sign. 
And uh, my message is that, you know, it's a challenging issue for China and also for the world because it's such a large country. And uh, it's a good opportunity if China is serious about that to become technology leaders. And if even China subsidizes that, that should be welcome for China and for the rest of the world. So let me start here. 